things that I would like to just pivot to here as we begin this next panel conversation um, is thinking about a, a phrase that I jotted down last night during Alicia Garza's keynote. And the phrase in talking about this country that we have to imagine, this rehumanized politics that we have to have, uh, the phrase she used was a set of new agreements. New agreements. And I, I loved how she didn't actually elaborate on that. Because she didn't say new agreements in the sense of the Bill Clinton's covenant, new covenant in 1992, or Newt Gingrich's contract with America in 1994, or this politician's 10 point plan to do this or that. Right? She said a new agreements. And we are parties to these new agreements. We are every day parties to agreements about how we're going to be, how we're going to see one another, what kind of politics we're going to cultivate for the next generation. And the panel that we have here of remarkable change makers uh, is really on the emerging new agreements in our politics now and the ways in which the storyline of American politics uh, is beginning to bend and break out of a simply Republican Democrat uh, frame. Uh, and break out of a frame uh, that allows people to be, well, entering a realm where there's a lot more, I suppose, a la carte uh, to how particularly a younger generation approaches uh, what they believe in public life. Uh, let me introduce our panelists. Um, uh, sitting right next to me uh, is uh, uh, my friend Heather McGee, who's president of Demos, uh, a public policy think tank and advocacy organization based in New York that focuses on remedying both economic and political inequality uh, and focusing on the interplay between the two. Uh, to her right, uh, my friend Stephen Olacara, who is the uh, founder and the executive director of the Millennial Action Project. Uh, and we will hear a bit more about uh, what Millennial Action Project does, but I'll say one thing. It's tr trying to activate uh, leaders of this millennial generation from uh, across the political spectrum and creating uh, what they've called future caucuses, uh, both in the United States Congress and now in state legislatures around the United States, uh, getting millennial age elected officials from both parties to come together and think about how uh, what they share in common from a generational perspective uh, might, uh, forgive the word, trump uh, uh, what uh, separates them uh, uh, in partisan terms. Uh, and then... <clears throat> Uh, and then farthest to my right, uh, uh, I suppose, literally, uh, 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 figuratively too, um, my friend Matt Kibbe, um, who uh, had been uh, uh, head of Freedom Works uh, and now is the founder of a new organization uh, called Free the People, uh, which is focusing also on millennials uh, in trying to create a cross-partisan movement for liberty uh, and thinking about the ways in which uh, libertarian ideas and libertarian politics, uh, for instance, of Rand Paul, uh, who during his run for uh, president, uh, uh, Matt uh, went to work for a super PAC for uh, Rand Paul, uh, but how perhaps for a millennial generation, uh, libertarian politics uh, uh, creates possibilities that again break the frame of Republican, Democrat, uh, or strictly left and right. So, um, <clears throat> yes, welcome. I just want to begin with a common question to all of you just to, to chew on, which is really um, right now what you feel like is the dominant um, uh, storyline uh, of change in American political life. Uh, and it's not just about like, oh, the dominant storyline is the rise of Donald Trump or the rise of Bernie Sanders, but what, what are the underlying shifts, the tectonic plates that are shifting and moving uh, that are giving us both a Trump and a Sanders and giving us the, uh, you know, the political turmoil that we have right now across left and, and, and right. Uh, um, uh, Matt, actually, why don't we start with you? Sure, I, and as a Republican presidential refugee, um, <laughs> I, I, I was working for Rand Paul and I watched Donald Trump like the rest of us. He's sort of the, the giant stay puffed marshmallow man of, <laughs> of American politics, if you guys get the Ghostbusters reference. Um, and oddly, and, and we, sh we, sh we could all despair about that, but I, I happen to be more optimistic than ever before because I think the Trump phenomenon and the Sanders phenomenon and the Ron Paul phenomenon and the, and the Tea Party and a thousand other examples 
are really the process of political disintermediation with people that had been disenfranchised or, as economists would say, ra rationally ignorant, just not paying attention. We, we have more information today. We have more power. We can self-organize. We can, we can sort of curate our interests and our ideas just the same way we curate music. And I think what looks like a disaster right now is just a breakup of an old paradigm that really wasn't that good for people power. It kept all of us out. It was a, it was a collusion of insiders. And, and I think what, whatever happens in the short run, we should figure out how to embrace the fact that more of us have more information. We can connect with each other. We can create our own communities. We can create our own solutions from the bottom up in a way that we never could before. You know, Heather, um, a lot of the uh, public policy proposals that Demos generates and, and focuses attention on um, are what you would broadly call progressive. Um, and yet I would imagine that you agree in part with what Matt is saying about we are witnessing the breakdown of uh, a system that is <clears throat> very much about insiders and outsiders and that there is a, a claim by a lot of people who have felt disenfranchised uh, in politics, economically and politically, um, to not accept that disenfranchisement anymore. H how do you see that playing out? That's right, and just I want to thank you, Eric, for putting on this really tremendous conference and, and inviting us all into this dialogue. So, thank you. Um, so, yes, I think we are at a sort of shattering moment of coalitions and strategies and communities in traditional American politics. And in some ways, it's very disturbing and distressing, particularly uh, if you are you know, a party official from either party. Um, uh, but in many ways, it is only right and fitting given where we are in the history of this country, where we are on the verge of a third reconstruction, where we are entering into what will need to be a plurality politics. Um, where there will have to be shifting coalitions that are based not only on identity, and there are many different dimensions of that, um, but also on community uh, in terms of geography and age and economic field in many ways. So all of this is okay. It's natural, it's right. This is what needs to happen right now in our politics. And I will take a very concrete example of that. And at Demos, we work on economic policy issues that frankly are the same that we've been talking about for the f past 15 years um, around what is it going to take to reconstruct the pathways to the middle class given trends in globalization, technological change, and of course, how power has responded to those forces. And the policy solutions we're talking about are th seen within the beltway as progressive because in fact, most Democrats don't even endorse them and fight for them. Things like debt-free college, which is an issue that we helped put on the map five years ago and that really was not at all in the center even of the Democratic Party debate until about 10 months ago. That is not among voters seen as a left-wing idea. First of all, it's seen as somewhat conservative because it's what our parents' generation had was debt-free public college. And the majority of Republican voters support the idea of refunding public college, getting rid of the 26 cents on the dollar per pupil cuts that have happened at the state level on average over the past 20 years, so just to make an investment in the future in that way. So we are seeing a time when economic issues are less left and right than more inside and outside of the beltway and in the political consensus. And I think that Donald Trump, because he is driving a nationalist economic agenda that is very much breaking with the economic orthodoxy of his party. If you think about why the powers that be in the Republican Party are so distressed about Trump, it's not necessarily because he's saying out loud what they've been saying through coded messages. It's not necessarily that they don't think he can win because they know that he's bringing in new, dem new Republicans into the party. It's because he's breaking with what they see as bedrock conservative principles. And if he's willing to tear up trade agreements and willing to uh, break with the Republican orthodoxy on the economy, that's more of a threat than the messages and than the vitriol and the violence. You know, Stephen, one of the things that is <clears throat> one thing that struck me when I was listening to Jim and Deb Fallows describing their travels, but also the sense um, of local renewal 
right, that is detached from national narrative, right, um, is, uh, you know, it was interesting when you uh, expanded the Future Caucus project from the United States Congress to state legislatures, right? And I'm wondering, as you made that shift from the nation's capital to the states, um, whether you got more of this vibe of renewal, resilience, uh, and cross-partisan uh, possibility. Uh, what, what, what did you sense? Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Great, next uh, question. Yeah, next question. Uh, first of all, let me just say once again, Eric, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to learn from you and to learn from the extraordinary group of people that you've brought together here and uh, also to the Citizen University team who's been working so hard to put this on. They really feel like family to me, so I just wanted to thank you for that. Thanks, brother. Uh, let me elaborate on yes. Uh, so, uh, and also add one more frame to this conversation. We've talked about left versus right, inside versus outside. I want to add a third frame to the conversation, which is future versus the past. As Eric mentioned a few years ago when the government shut down, uh, we organized uh, the Millennial Action Project, the first ever uh, youth caucus in Congress that was bipartisan. And I remember when we came up with this, we we're like, how's there never been a, a convening of all the youngest members of Congress who represent the future and who will inherit the challenges related to our, uh, our debt or to our environment and these other big challenges? They've never come together in a bipartisan way. And uh, we brought them together through uh, what's the, called the Bipartisan Congressional Future Caucus. And they made a tremendous amount of progress on a variety of issues from, from impact investing to philanthropy uh, to other issues. But then we started hearing from state legislators and even local legislators where uh, today most of the young rising stars in our democracy are taking their first steps in politics. And I remember we, we started some of our first caucuses in Colorado and in Wisconsin and Hawaii and Pennsylvania. And they were so quick to get started that within a few months they already had their first piece of legislation. And I'll give one example which really I think illustrates this future versus the past type framing which is the emergence of the sharing economy or some people call it the gig economy. How many people here use Uber or a Lyft or Airbnb? Wow. And this whole issue has become extremely disruptive. There have been concerns uh, from the left on issues related to labor and, and the changes in the workplace and the benefits and safety precautions we have. Um, some concerns uh, perhaps from the right that this is you know, a new and innovative industry that's uh, changing the way things have been done. Um, but there are also arguments to support it from the left and the right. And uh, we saw very quickly on this issue a not a left or right divide, but a more generational divide. Uh, not only are young legislators the early adopters of these technologies, they actually use them, um, but there's uh, less of this sense of a fear of unknown. Um, they're not afraid to take on these new technologies and find a way to legislate. So the first statewide legislation to embrace this new sharing economy was our uh, future caucus in Colorado, a bipartisan bill that was signed into law, and then was quickly cross-pollinated into other states and other young legislators said, you know, we're finding the same challenges in our states and, and we want to adopt a similar legislation in our state. And now it's in uh, 10 to 13 or so states uh, that have adopted that type of legislation. And so I just use that as an example of this new future versus the past uh, framing and what I think is perhaps the biggest storyline uh, to answer your original question, which is the collision between increasing gridlock and dysfunction, which is the dominant storyline, with this rising millennial generation, which is a majority now political independents that have a variety of views, really uh, some people call us the a la carte generation, and I think that collision is going to be very exciting and create lots of opportunities for unlikely coalitions. Matt, this uh, exciting set of collisions about to happen here, you, you, you've launched uh, this uh, platform, Free the People, and uh, you, you've been um, both creating very uh, compelling short videos uh, starring uh, you and your beard, uh, 
um, which has become as popular on Twitter as the, the, the words that you're saying. It's, it's trending. Yeah, it's trending. Uh, um, but you've been, um, uh, in, in a sense, picking up a little bit where Stephen left off, um, uh, speaking generationally uh, 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 about these terms. How are you trying to speak to millennials about a liberty agenda? Um, and how does that differ from how you previously have spoken about uh, these, these issues and ideas? Yeah, I mean, and I think this journey for me started when you and I debated a couple years ago and, and PBS was hoping that we would yell at each other because that's what you're supposed to do. And afterwards you came, and came to me and said, you know what, I think we agree on more than we disagree. And I think that's sort of emblematic of where we are today. I got involved in, in some really interesting work on criminal justice reform. And, and all of my favorite guys on Capitol Hill were working with some of the most progressive members on the left. And it wasn't a pretend thing. It was a real concern that, that federal legislation had created mass incarceration and we could do something about it. I think there's a lot of narratives like that. And I think, um, we've, I've already heard it twice, the a la carte generation. I think for young people, shopping between traditional Republican and traditional Democrat what I call the two-party duopoly is sort of like shopping in a mall in Caracas. There's absolutely nothing on the shelf for them. And, they, and that's not how they think about things. So I think, I think it's provocative to find places where progressives and libertarians can work together. Um, I'm gonna be working more with sort of hardcore libertarians who are sort of turned off by politics altogether. But I also wanna to talk to conservatives because I think um, on some of these issues, we have to bring conservative Republicans along. Um, and I use criminal justice as an example of that. That's where most of the change has happened because Republicans have been convinced that this, this tough on crime rhetoric was bad public policy. You know, one thing that struck me in one of our earlier conversations, Matt, was um, how you were beginning to describe that, uh, you know, libertarianism in its caricature, and I plead guilty uh, to, to having uh, written some caricatures, uh, um, uh, in its caricature form is about um, a completely atomistic hyper-individualism, right? Um, and you pointed out uh, that both in some of the theory, but, but certainly in how you're trying to talk about it now uh, to a millennial generation, that a, a liberty agenda, a libertarian agenda, actually rests on people voluntarily choosing community, uh, choosing to do things together, right? Now, that point of view, uh, I suppose stops at the point where doing things together involves government, uh, but uh, you're trying to go for as much voluntary uh, communal uh, activity as possible. And, and, and Heather, I want to kind of swing this uh, back to you because, you know, Demos's work too is interesting in sort of a mirror image way. I mean, it hasn't been just a, a blind obedience to we want an ever larger federal government, right? Um, there's always been this dimension of uh, the strength of the republic, both economically and um, uh, and, and civically uh, depends on uh, strengthening individual capacity uh, and voice and muscle. And um, say a little bit about that and how you all have been trying to kind of complexify the caricature, I guess, of right. what folks on the left are about. Right. I think that's right. Thank you, Eric. So, um, so first of all, my organization's name, Demos, is the Greek word for the people and the root word of democracy. And I became president of Demos two years ago, and I was faced with a question, should I change the ridiculously esoteric name of my organization? <laughs> and uh, I decided not to. We decided not to, um, partly because I've really grown to love what it means. Because I believe that in America, this question of can we become a Demos, a people, made up of all the peoples in the world, is in fact beyond the public policy debates, beyond the political philosophy debates, the sort of fundamental overarching question of our politics and of our time. And it's only getting more so the case. And so there are some fascinating questions we have to ask at this moment. When in fact the immigration from uh, you know, non-Northern European uh, parts of the world is accelerating and therefore changing the uh, literal skin color complexion of who is an American, if not the actual diversity of where we're from, what, what connects us? Why are we met here? And I think there is a uh, competing narrative that all of the world's peoples will have been met here in this new world of the United States of America to compete with one another. 
right? Like that, that is in many ways sort of an underlying story of how we could answer the question uh, of why we're all here. What does it mean to, for America to be the world? I think that there's another answer to that question, which is just as individualistic in terms of um, our belief in self-expression and self-actualization, which in a country where you can see buttons that say Oprah Chopra 2016, <laughs> um, is actually one of our core tenets, right? Um, very much here on the West Coast, right? That it's not, individual, um, it's not individuality in a competitive way, but in a self-actualization and self-expression way. There's another story about why we're all met here. And maybe it is that here, in this place which was founded on a belief in racial hierarchy. That this might be the place where the proximity of all the world's peoples would give lie to that idea. We are not yet there. But I do believe that that is our destiny as a country. That is what will really make this a new world. Stephen, did you want yeah, to jump just one of my favorite books is, a, is called Non-Zero by Robert Wright. And basically what he argues in the book is by if you look at the entire history of humans, that there actually is a direction uh, to where we're going. And that's exactly what Heather just mentioned, that um, we are increasingly interdependent and increasingly we need not zero sum, uh, but non-zero sum solutions um, in our world, and, um, and 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 I want to pick up on another point she mentioned um, about about race and, and the nature of this country. I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which uh, is known for some things like beer and cheese, but also, unfortunately, the most racially, ethnically, and politically segregated metro area in the United States. And I felt very conflicted growing up because I kept going between these two sides, the white line, the black line, the, the rich line, the poor line. And, and I was very confused and I didn't understand where exactly I fit into that whole picture. But I think that actually is the reason why I decided to go into this whole space of uh, political bridge building because I think that is the America that we're heading towards. That is inevitably the direction we're headed and I uh, just want to echo what Heather's saying because I agree with it a lot. Well I think um, you know this idea of facing the line between the white side and the black side, the rich side, the poor side uh, is just another variation on the theme that Matt articulated a moment ago which is we are in ways that are exciting and exhilarating and scary and disruptive uh, living through an age where the duopoly is breaking. right? Uh, and that's the Republican-Democrat duopoly. It is a left-right duopoly. Uh, but it is just the idea of duopoly itself, uh, that you have to choose one or the other. Uh, and I think one of the things that is uh, incumbent upon us as citizen activists, as citizen educators, as uh, citizen healers, as citizen pastors uh, in the work that we're doing to just see one another, um, is to recognize that uh, yes, it's a whole lot more complicated when you get past two, uh, but that's life. And for most of this country's history, we've been living in a little bit of a dream uh, that life could be boiled down to two, that life could be boiled down to these yes-no, zero-sum choices. And uh, now we get the hard, exciting, challenging work uh, of uh, dealing with that uh, complexity. And so I just want to thank our remarkable panel for giving us a little bit of wisdom about how we can navigate that change in that future and be part of this new narrative of American identity. Please join me in thanking Matt, Stephen, and Heather.